just one second. All right, welcome to your hour with APA Virginia. I'm Martina James, um, staff to the APA Virginia chapter, and I'm thrilled that everyone can join us today. I know people are trickling in and we have people that pop in in the first couple minutes of this, but in order to stay on schedule and keep the time, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, this month's webinar is the Dunn Platt, an adaptation of Joseph Smith's plan for the city of Zion in 19th century Virginia, presented by Joseph W. Grubbs, um, PhD, AICP, GISP, all of, you have all of the uh, certifications, <laughs> sir, you know, all the things. I'm, we're excited to have you here with us this, this month, and um, Eldon James and I were very fortunate to um, preview this webinar and, and, and talk with um, Joe about this. And so I'm thrilled that our members and other guests get to join us for this webinar. Before we get started, I wanna share a couple of quick reminders as I do each month. Um, I encourage people to visit virginia.planning.org where you can find all of our chapter announcements, our, up our upcoming conference updates and webinar listings. We are looking forward to hosting our annual conference again in person, um, July 17th through the 20th. 2022 at the downtown Marriott in Richmond, Virginia. So um, you'll start to see a lot of information populated in the next day or two, um, next couple of days with conference registration rates and um, programming and opening up registration. So we really are looking forward to being in person again and having everybody join us. But in the meantime, we hope you'll join us for your hour with APA Virginia, which is the fourth Monday of every month from noon to one o'clock. Um, and then just a couple reminders, um, as we always do. Um, as we progress through the webinar, I encourage you to chat with other attendees um, in the chat box, but please put your questions in the Q&A box. Often questions get lost amongst the chat thread, and so it's hard for us to go back and find them when we move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. So again, please put those in that Q&A box. At the end, um, when we move into Q&A, you can use the raise the hand icon. If you click that, we will give you the opportunity to unmute yourself. You can even turn your camera on if you want. You don't have to, but you can ask your question live rather than typing it in. Sometimes um, we know that's easier than writing out several sentences in a question if you have a longer question or if you just want to pop on and say hi, we, we encourage that too. So feel free to do that. If you have any questions um, throughout, just let us know. You can message me in, in the chat box as well. The webinar is being recorded as always. And after the webinar, it will be posted to our YouTube page. Um, and we'll also send out a post webinar email with the recording link, as well as any supporting materials um, that our presenter um, shares with us. He's gonna share his slide deck and, and some other links and resources. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna hand it over to you, Joe, so you can take it from here. You should be ready to go. Excellent. All right, if you just wanna pop it into presentation mode and I think we'll be Absolutely, good. there we go. All right. Awesome. <clears throat> Martina, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much to APA Virginia for this opportunity. Uh, very excited to uh, have a chance to present the uh, extensive analysis that we uh, did. When I say we, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about you know those of us who are involved in this effort uh, for the Library of Virginia uh, in just a second. But I do want to I do want to point out um, first of all that uh, I joked with Martina that I think I'm going for the most boring slide deck uh, presentation background. Uh, I'm doing this intentionally um, because even though my, my day job is with Virginia Department of Transportation, I did this strictly as a volunteer. So what you're gonna be seeing today um, does not reflect any, anything in terms of uh, you know, VDOT's uh, involvement or anything of that nature, nor the Library of Virginia, although we did this work um, you know, directly to support LVA. But um, so that's why there's no affiliation noted on here. So, I do want to draw your attention both on the lead-in slide as well as on the last slide. You will see, um, you'll see my contact information. I encourage you to reach out if you have any questions or would like to discuss this further. It's been uh, a lot of fun. It's been a, a great process, 
and uh, hopefully you'll find it rewarding. And uh, thanks so much for your participation today. So to begin, let me first of all, just do some acknowledgements. Uh, again, thanks so much to APA Virginia uh, for hosting this webinar. I do wanna point out that um, uh, Cassandra Britt Farrell, Cassandra Farrell, who is the senior map archivist at the Library of Virginia. Uh, she was my partner in crime throughout most of this. And I, I believe uh, Cassandra's on today's call. So thanks so much, Cassandra, for your uh, leadership and support through this effort. And then uh, Eric Bootsma, who's a Richmond-based architect, uh, you'll see one of his conceptual renderings later on in the presentation, uh, big support, big help uh, through this process. So today what I'd like to do is uh, start off, first of all, with just an overview of the subject plan, the done plan, and then talk, uh, go into a little bit more detail, kind of uh, highlighting the analysis that we did of, of the Dunn Platt, um, and then focus on you know, kind of how we came about uh, to determine that the Dunn Platt, the subject plat, was in fact an adaptation of Joseph Smith's plan for the city of Zion. And Joseph Smith, of course, was the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the LDS. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, Joseph Smith's Zion plan, the original Zion plan, and then we'll call the revised Zion plan. Uh, then we'll do some uh, comparisons between the Dunn Platt and those revised Zion plans. Uh, then talk uh, about the development planning, just some you know general things to know about development planning uh, during this time period um, and how a, a, a Zion plan or a Dunn Platt would have been put into effect. Um, and then we'll come, you know, wrap it up with our conclusions and some of the remaining questions that we have as a result of this research. And then we'll open it up for questions and some general discussion. So first of all, let's start off with the subject plat. Uh, this is what it looks like. So this is the done plat. And I've added a link, as uh, Martina mentioned, I'll be providing this slide deck so you can have, you can click on the links and uh, go all over the place uh, to uh, you know find out you know more information about the sources that were used for this analysis. Uh, but this is what it looks like. This is um, this is the you know what I first saw when I first took a peek at it. Uh, the first time I saw it was in May of 2015, and I I really had a very strong sense that I knew what I was looking at um, right from the very beginning. And so the whole process and what I wanna to do today is kind of walk you through that process of discovery and analysis that led us to some of the conclusions that were drawn about this done plan. But this was our starting point. First of all, some metadata on the done plan. Uh, it was acquired, um, it's at session number 5870, acquired by the Library of Virginia. Uh, again, the author is Thomas R. Dunn. Uh, he's a civil engineer, T.R. Dunn, civil engineer, uh, very prominent. His, his family was uh, very prominent and connected in the Petersburg area in the late, uh, mid to late 1800s. Um, T.R. Dunn himself would become the, uh, the chief engineer for the city of Petersburg. So, you know, someone who's very prominent in engineering and development circles in that time period. Uh, the plat was located, the draft of the plat was located um, in Petersburg. And you can see in the, in the bottom right hand corner, of the subject plot, um, that's all there was to, you know, that we started with. That's all we had to go on uh, beginning this process. Um, so we had T.R. Dunn's signature, you know, his sign and uh, not a seal, but sign in his location of Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, through the course of the analysis, uh, we, we dated this uh, plot um, anywhere from 1870 to 1900. I think there are more, more of the pointers or indicators are suggesting that this was done in um, you know, roughly the 1880s. Uh, but again, it was acquired by the Library of Virginia in 2015. Um, this was not a small piece of work. This is uh, the dimensions of this. It measures 29 and a half inches by 27, roughly 27 and one eighth of an inch. Uh, so I don't know, you can't really see because of the blurred background, but that's that's the working, my working version on the drafting table behind me. So it's a fairly, fairly large, substantial document. Um, the media that were used, it was pen and ink on cloth. So this was all hand drawn. Um, and you can definitely tell, you know, with the, the um, calligraphy, the writing uh, that was done throughout, it's very, very beautifully done. And uh, there were a couple of notable features that, that immediately struck our attention. Uh, first of all, the, 
plant was folded down into roughly letter size, um, you know, carrying, you can see the very distinct creases, uh, the fold lines, um, but it, it, was, it was designed and folded down to travel. Um, we noted up in the top corners, the uh, both, both corners, there was a total of um, roughly six pen holes um, in the top corners, suggesting that it had been penned uh, up and viewed um, on multiple occasions and then folded back down uh, into the eight by eight and a half size panel. Uh, so roughly letter size to carry around. Uh, also, we noticed that um, in many of the parcels, there were names and letters, you know, code symbols uh, that were written into the parcels, suggesting that, you know, almost it was like a lot inventory, right? You know, so, you know, a parcel inventory uh, where names were being written in, where people who are interested um, in, you know, potentially in a, a development of this nature that, um, you know, they could, you know, put, pretty much put their name literally uh, into the parcel to, to claim a pers a prospective parcel out of this development. Um, but one of the biggest things we noted is that there were no geographical features, right? You're not going to see any mountains, you know, streams, on, uh, you know, nearby, you know, roadways or anything of that nature. It is straight up, um, you know, just the blocks and lots and streets, you know, all of that configured. No coordinates at the corners, nothing to tell you um, where this was located. There was no there, there, right? So nothing to go on uh, in that regard. And also it was oriented to the West. So the West is at the top part uh, of this plat relative to where TR Dunn uh, signed the plat. So it's oriented to the West. So those are a couple of things that, you know, on first sight kind of, you know, had us scratching our heads and saying, okay, what exactly is this? Because if you can uh, compare it to other, you know, development plans, other plats that would have been done back in the same time period, um, you would have seen geographic features, you know, you would have a name that would be assigned to the proposed development, whether it's a new development or extension of an existing development. Um, none of that uh, was apparent in the done. So as we, as we reviewed this, and as I said, when I first saw this back in 2000, May of 2015, all of these things started pointing to this, you know, this being something quite unique. Um, based on, you know, my back, uh, not, you know, my background, as well as some of the, the studies that I'd done, and particularly for my AICP exam, um, I had a feeling that this looked very much like a um, Joseph Smith's plan for the city of Zion. Uh, so we can, I kind of had an inkling that, that that's what this was. Uh, but to get to that, we needed to really dive into the details of the plan. So what I did was I started um, really reverse engineering the plat, uh, the plat dimensions, you know, all of this. I started doing uh, some detailed analysis to try to find out whether or not that hypothesis that this was an adaptation of Joseph Smith's plan for the city of Zion was in fact a, a valid hypothesis. So let's go through some of the things, uh, some of the immediate things, analyses that were conducted. First of all, you know, from an urban design standpoint, uh, the plat contains 234 numbered blocks. So you have uh, blocks one through 16, you can see at the very bottom of the plat, um, it was 16 blocks across and 15 blocks high. So 234, those are the numbered blocks. Um, the blocks were designed um, and the, the whole layout was designed in an urban grid pattern. Um, so the only blocks that really were not numbered were the blocks at the central square, as well as, uh, which uh, consisted of four blocks, it took up four blocks. And then you have smaller squares at each and each of the quadrants. Uh, so, and of course the urban grid pattern was pretty typical. I mean, you know, you can, you can look back at, at urban planning history, uh, look at examples of urban, you know, urban towns, cities that were laid out based on urban grid pattern. Of course, William Penn's uh, plan for, for um, Philadelphia, Oglethorpe's plan for Savannah, you know, all th these had the urban grid pattern, but other characteristics immediately began to come to mind, especially as we were 
um, you know, started to dive into the into the analysis. And one of the first things that I did as part of this reverse engineering process was look at the block dimensions. So based on, you know, based on my my understanding of Joseph Smith's Zion plan, I kind of put it out there. I said, okay, if if this was truly an adaptation based on the Zion plan, then you know I could tell that the blocks in this particular in the Dunplat were not square, um, but I you know I could tell that looking at the block height, that um, you know the height was going to be was going to be um, it was going to be higher than it was wide. So I assumed I just said, okay, if we had a six hundred and sixty foot block height, what what else would fall into place, right? What else exactly would fall into place? It was, I assumed, a 660 foot block height. Um, and what I found was most of the major tenants, uh, the principles of Joseph Smith's Zion plan fell into place based on that 660 foot block height. Um, one of the first things immediately, um, if the height was 660 feet, or approximately 40 poles, if you use uh, the, the survey methods of the time, um, the, the width of the block uh, was 600 feet, and then started to do analysis you know, from that starting point. Um, that gives you with a, a 660 foot by 600 feet, that gives you um, 396,000 square feet or just, just under, you know, very nearly 10 acres. Um, and you'll notice that looking at the uh, looking at the, the plat, that you this configuration uh, yielded 24 lots per block. So it was 12 lots uh, on either side of the street, or you know, of an alleyway. Um, and this alleyway that ran through the center of the street. We'll get to the streets and alleys in just a second. Uh, but the configuration of the blocks was. 24 lots or parcels in a block, and then 12, you know, 12 on each side of the street or 12 on each side of the alley, depending on how you look. So the next thing we looked at were the actual parcels. Um, if you if you tally up all of the parcels uh, that are that are defined in the plat, you have a total of 5,448 parcels. Um, that consists, you know, it's made up of 5,136 parcels in the 214 typical blocks. And by typical block, what I mean is that most of the blocks um, are of that typical size and dimension, the dimensions that I just uh, previously stated. Um, there are, there's a row of 16 blocks at the top of the plat. So the very top row of, of blocks um, are configured somewhat differently. They only have 14 parcels per block. Um, and then around the central square, um, there were 88 parcels in the four blocks uh, mm -hmm. with, um, with 22 parcels per block. So um, again, most of the blocks um, are, you know, are those typical, mm -hmm. the 214 are the, the typical blocks. And then the remainder um, are, you know, the 16 blocks and then the four blocks that, that deviate. But it gives you a total of 5,448 parcels. So one of the immediate indications was that, you know, this was no small scale development that was being discussed. We'll go into more detail on that in just a few minutes. But that's a that's a fair that's an ambitious uh, plan, you know, given given that number of parcels uh, for the time period. But Breaking it down into some of the parcel dimensions, this is um, this is where we found other indicators of the Dunplatt's uh, alignment uh, with and you know being consistent with Smith's Zion plan. Um, there, each parcel was um, 55 foot in height, so the street frontage uh, was 55 feet on the street, and then a depth of 275 feet. For each parcel, which gave a parcel um, frontage to depth ratio of one to five, and that one to five partial um, uh, parcel ratio was very consistent with Joseph Smith's uh, Zion plan. Uh, so this led to each of the um, each of the parcels being 
just over a third of an acre, so 0.35 uh, acres uh, per parcel. Now let's talk about the, uh, to me, which uh, what was, even though I started with the block height as a starting point for, um, you know, for determining, you know, assessing whether or not this was consistent with Smith Zion plan. Once I, once I got the, uh, the block height that's 660 feet, I immediately looked at the street width. And what I found was that the street width, all of the streets, every street within this plat, um, was 132 feet in width. Um, that's a very wide street, first and foremost, but that is exactly the street width from Smith's Zion plan. All of the streets in Joseph Smith's Zion plan uh, were 132 feet. And we'll go, we'll show that in just a few minutes and talk a bit in a bit more detail. But when you consider that the typical street width, uh, if you look at, you know, kind of uh, urban design, you know, history of urban design and urban design kind of manuals or guidelines, you know, at the time period, um, you'll find that a the typical urban or even suburban street width back in the latter part of the 1800s was 30 to 50 feet wide. So when you consider 132 feet um, as the street width and that all of the streets, not just the, the major, you know, arterials or cross streets, but all of the streets were 132 feet and width. That's that's very substantial. The other thing that came into play, we looked at um, the north and south streets were just simply numbered, First Avenue to 16th Avenue, but the, the east-west streets were actually named for US states. And those US states that were named, all of them had significance to, to the LDS, uh, to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, to so the Mormon Church. Um, all of them had significance, LDS significance. So in other words, um, you know, the, the state names that were chosen, they weren't all clustered in a geographic area. Um, they weren't all Southern states, for example, um, but each of them had LDS significance. The other thing that was noted um, that, you know, in the Dunn plat that was not in the, uh, the Smith Zion plan were alleys. Uh, the alley width, first of all, consistent with the width of the street, the alley width was 50 feet. All of the alleys were 50 feet wide. So a very substantial um, alleyway. Uh, that was, you know, the fact that Smith did not have alley shown in the original Zion plan, but here we are in the latter part, you know, half a century later, and you have Joseph, um, I'm sorry, you have T.R. Dunn putting alleys into into the you know into his plat, um, this would have been consistent with urban design practices in the time. And here I'm, I'm quoting from Canaan and Associates, uh, their short history of alleys. That you know during this time period, you had urban designers that were adding alleyways, uh, quite simply to hide. This is a quote to to hide the more utilitarian, less attractive functions of urban life, including service and servant access, barns for horses, carriages, and even small shops and areas for children to play. So um, it's, very, it's very consistent with urban design practices at the time uh, for there to be, you know, for alleys to be added to this design. So that's kind of a, an overview um, of, you know, the, the design characteristics itself. But one of the things, when I say that this was not, a, you know, a small scale, um, when you look at it, you know, the development footprint and the, the holding capacity, if you will, of the, of the proposed development, the footprint itself was um, just under five miles. I mean, it's, it's plus or minus, I mean, it's pretty much right at five miles, uh, five square miles, I should say. So that, that would make this um, just smaller than the present day city of Fairfax, not Fairfax County, obviously but the, the city of Fairfax. So when you consider this, I mean, that's, that's ambitious. I mean, that's, a, that's not a small scale development. We're talking, not just talking about a neighborhood that was being proposed. That's, that's a substantial footprint there. And if you take that 5,448 parcels and multiply it by the number of persons per household that was Virginia's average at the time uh, in 1880 is 5.69, persons per household, 
that gives you a capacity of, of more than 30,000 persons. Um, so that's not, that's no small population that we're talking about. It would put it on par back in the, uh, back in 1880, it would, it, population wise with the population of Petersburg, Virginia and Norfolk, Virginia. So again, very substantial uh, in terms of the development footprint and capacity. So that's, those are some of the basics of, of the done plan, right? Those are, those, you know, that, that was the, you know, these are the, the primary findings from our, our analysis of this. And let me give you an idea. This, again, I want to thank Eric Bootsma uh, for this rendering. This is kind of a typical block, if you will. Uh, so if this were built out, you know, based on this typical, you would, this is what, you know, essentially it would look like. And you can note here all of the street widths being 132 feet wide, the 50 foot alleyways, uh, the 660 foot block height, and then the, um, the 600 foot block depth, which includes uh, 275 feet for each of, you know, for each parcel on either side of the alley, plus the 50 foot alley. And again, that, that gives you the you know, 55 feet of, of street frontage for each parcel. Uh, and the 275 foot depth that gives you that one to five parcel ratio that we're looking at here. But um, Eric again did a beautiful job on this rendering. And I think it gives uh, a, an excellent example of really kind of the, the principles that were laid out in Smith's plan and that we see further articulated in, in TR Dunn's plan. Um, one of the most, uh, one of the most um, prominent things that you'll notice that is that each parcel uh, has you know enough land area on it to support um, you know the necessary kind of small scale agriculture that would have been needed. You've got you know a barn facility or something that could have been put in the back, either for animal husbandry or or some other type of use. But you know you've got the ability on each parcel uh, to to be sort of sustainable for the family unit, right? And that was the that was that was key. That was one of the, the key principles. In fact, in the the Smith plan that we'll take a look at here in just a second, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, the major industrial uses and so forth um, would have been, you know, small scale would have been done, you know, for each, you know, family scale would have been done, you know, within each parcel, but a lot of the bigger, you know, heavier uses would have been off site. but each parcel would, each family would have been able to sustain themselves with, um, you know, the agriculture and some of the other uses within each parcel. So I keep referring to uh, Joseph Smith's plan for the city of Zion. You know, what, what made us think that the Dunn Platt was uh, consistent with and, you know, uh, an adaptation of Smith's Zion plan. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, Smith, the, the Zion plan itself um, and some of the, the modifications that were made. So first of all, Joseph Smith issued um, the, the plan for the city of Zion in June 1833 uh, for followers of the LDS. And it was laid out, it wasn't like, you know, if you, if you look back at, you know, Philip II of Spain and the laws of the Indies where, you know, the, the King of Spain laid out, you know, pretty much regulations, right? On that, you know, thou shalt build out based on, uh, you know, these principles or these regulations uh, for new settlements. Smith's Zion Plan, you know, it, it provided, act, you know, very definite guidance on things, but it was more of a statement of religious principles than hard and fast regulations. Okay, so as a result, I mean, even Joseph Smith himself, um, very soon after uh, the first iteration, the first original Zion Plan, um, just a few months later, there was a, a modified, a revised Zion Plan that was issued um, to tackle some, some of the inconsistencies, some of the things that were in the original set of instructions that, um, you know, that, that needed clarifying. Uh, but in addition to that, leaders, uh, you know, church leaders, LDS leaders throughout the 19th century um, continuously made modifications. They, they modified and adapted the Zion, Smith Zion Plan and the principles in the Zion Plan to meet the, the local development characteristics. So that was one of the unique things. And this was done quite frequently. Um, if, you, if you look, there was um, uh, there are a couple of great resources on this that I'd be happy to share with you. 
But, you know, when you consider that more than 500 settlements um, across North America were built out in the latter part of the, the 1800s uh, based on Joseph Smith's plan for the city of Zion. So this wasn't just, you know, uh, something that was reserved for, for Utah, which, you know, we typically think of Salt Lake City, you know, which very much was based on Smith's Zion plan. Uh, but there were 500, more than 500 LDS settlements throughout North America that were that were built based on the Zion plan or some adaptation of the Zion plan and those development principles. Uh, the American Planning Association um, obviously recognized the significance of Smith's Zion plan and, and awarded it or recognized it as a national planning landmark back in 1996. And uh, I put a couple of links in here. Um, it, it's not gone away. Uh, there was recently uh, both in Vermont, I think in Vermont, it, it uh, died during the, or either during or right before the entitlement process started. Uh, but in Vermont and in Florida, um, two LDS uh, sort of driven developments, uh, very large scale, very consistent, you know, in the scale that we're talking about here that were being proposed, um, you know, just recently within the last several years, um, based on Smith's Zion plan. So it's, it's something that, you know, not just the, the historical context of this, but this is still something that's part of our narrative for urban planning, uh, at least in the United States. So that's a little bit of the, the basics on Smith's Zion plan. Um, let's take a peek. So, you know, when I say that when I, when I first saw the Dunplatt, you know, I kind of had an idea of what I was looking at. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the two side by side. So obviously you have Smith's original uh, Zion plan on the left-hand side, and then the Dunplatt, of course, on the right-hand side. So a couple of things to draw your attention to. First of all, look at the street widths, right? I mean, they're you know consistent. Joseph Smith's plan, the original Zion plan, had um, all of the street widths were 132 feet. That's spelled out. You can see the the writing, you know, on all sides of the plan that were part of his instructions uh, to the LDS faithful. Uh, but you also see um, very consistent uh, parcel dimensions and, and block dimensions, very similar to what you see in the Dunplat. However, notice the crisscross, the crosshatch pattern of Smith's original Zion plan. You'll see, you'll see um, this in the revised as well. That got changed in time. That was one of the modifications that occurred in time. But, but there are definite parallels with uh, the original Zion plan and the Dunplatt that, um, that, that raised our attention and that started that original hypothesis that we had. This is the what would they call the revised Zion plan. And this was issued, as I mentioned, just a few months after um, the original plan was issued. Uh, so you can still see the crosshatch pattern, but now you see a very, very close uh, comparison between the revised Zion plan and the Dunn plan. Um, street widths were modified a little bit. Um, the, not all of the streets in the revised plan were 132 feet, only four, only the major cross streets around the central square were 132 feet. The, the rest were, were uh, lessened a little bit. And I think one of the reasons why is, you know, developing all street widths 132 feet. I mean, that's, that's land intensive. And so that was one of the reasons, you know, or, or you know, put out there is one of the reasons why you had the, uh, the modification there uh, to make the plan more adaptable, to make it more of a living plan so it could be more easily adapted to new locations. But you can definitely see the central square the way that the central square was modified to enable it to fit more evenly into the urban grid pattern, uh, very similar to, um, to the Dunplatt in that regard. So very close comparisons there. So just so you have an idea of, of you know, nuts and bolts of this, how these, how these compare. So you see that the, uh, First column of numbers and, and information is for the original Zion plan. The middle column is for the revised Zion plan. And then the last is for the Dunplatt. So you can see that the Dunplatt is substantially larger uh, in footprint. Uh, but when you look at the block dimension, dimensions, very consistent. 
um, there. So, um, you know, the 660 foot block height in particular, uh, very consistent there. Uh, the number of parcels, again, the Dunn Platt was, was very highly ambitious uh, compared to the original and to the revised, um, you know, twice the number, pretty much, well, twice the number of parcels as the revised uh, Zion plan. Uh, but to accommodate that, they, um, they shrunk, if you will, the parcel size, the individual parcel size. Uh, Dunn Dun shrunk uh, the, the, um, the parcel size compared to the original and revised Zion plan. The original and revised Zion plan were both half acre lots, uh, whereas uh, Dunn kind of shrunk those down to a third of an acre. The central square, again, it was rectangular and the original Zion plan, um, the revised Zion plan sort of squared it up to enable it to uh, fit into the grid pattern. And then Dunn matched the actual blocks, actually consumed four blocks for the central square uh, to, uh, to meet the grid pattern. Street names, um, the original Zion plan did not have street names at all, but for the revised Zion plan, uh, the, the identical type of uh, numbering uh, that was mentioned, but also naming some of the streets uh, based on LDS significant people and places. So that's something that you started to see in the revised Zion plan. And again, that was there in the, um, in the Dunn Platt uh, street width. Again, Dunn was true to the original Zion plan. Um, all of the streets were 132, um, 132 feet wide. As I mentioned in the revised Zion plan, uh, not all of the streets, just the main cross streets around the central square for 132 feet, 21 streets were reduced to 82.5 feet, but that's still substantial. Again, when you take into consideration uh, what the, the typical urban or suburban street width was uh, in, the, um, in the 1800s. And then finally, you see the you know, more substantial uh, population that was anticipated. Um, the original Zion plan, you, know, you had an enormous per persons per household. Uh, that was reduced in the revised Zion plan. Uh, still, both plans giving you roughly 20,000 persons total. And then the Dunn Platt, um, higher than that, roughly 30,000 persons based on that Virginia average of 5.69 persons per household. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the Zion plan, not just the revised plan, but as the LDS started, you know, or continued its move to the West, ultimately, of course, uh, Utah became, you know, the, the main gathering place, Salt Lake City in particular. But, you know, there were other locations uh, along that, that westward migration of the LDS. So I wanted to highlight a couple of these um, just to show that the, um, how the, the Zion plan was modified uh, to fit the requirements or the context of each of the, the new locations. So the first, the first I'll show you is a very prominent, um, one of the most important uh, cities outside of Salt Lake City, uh, definitely one of the most important uh, settlements as the LDS moved westward, and that is the, uh, the city of Nauvoo. And you'll see here and uh, on the left-hand side, again, I left the Dunn Platt on the right-hand side so you can see um, the, uh, you know, for comparison purposes, but the, the panels in the Nauvoo plat and, and plan that are colored in, you see those, you know, that's, uh, those are around the central square area. But one of the things that you'll notice is that, you know, Nauvoo was an existing town, right? This wasn't some totally new, uh, new settlement that, you know, it was how to incorporate and adapt the Zion plan to meet the local context. Um, but you also see in addition to how that was done, um, there are geographic features being shown here. Um, this, you know, again, the, the original and revised Zion plans did not show the geographic features, but within each location, um, you had the LDS followers that were, that were working to adapt Smith's Zion plan to fit the local context showing what that local context was. So here um, you've got, you know, this is, uh, Nauvoo is in Illinois. So you've got along the banks of the Mississippi River, um, you know, that river is shown in some of the other geographic features 
and uh, are shown in this in this uh, rendering, but it's still an adaptation of Smith Zion. Okay, so that's for Nauvoo. And then smaller scale, but I wanted to bring this up winter quarters, which is um, near uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Um, winter quarters, one of the things that you'll note here, in addition to the fact that you had um, now, not only the geographic features being shown and how this would sit in in the, in the local geographic context, uh, but also notice that the crosshatch pattern has been changed. So all of the parcels are going in the same direction. Uh, so that's another adaptation of the Zion plan that's consistent or that Dunn's plat is consistent with um, losing that crosshatch pattern. So that was one of the things that was prominent in, in winter quarters uh, was roughly 80, um, 18, uh, 1846, 1847. So, you know, about a generation before uh, Dunn would have, would have drafted uh, this plat. So a couple of a couple of things about the development context and how these would have been, you know, how these types of settlements would have been handled. Um, in effect, they're kind of like how we would handle planned unit developments today, right? So you you know you have a new a concept for a new town. Um, you've got everything with regard to what the footprint is going to be, the block and parcel configuration, street layout, all of that with the plat. Um, and you, the way you would approach it is, again, very similar to a PUD. You would submit all of that with the land plan, okay? And the, the Nauvoo plan that you just saw in the winter quarters plan, um, you know, these actual settlements based on Smith Zion plan um, reflect that in, in what was submitted uh, for the land claim and what was, what was attempted as part of the overall development plan. So, taking into consideration that local context, factoring that uh, into the development plan for this. But you know, the, the fact that the Dunplat lacked those geographic features, um, you know, it, it kind of leads us, you know, led us to thinking that, you know, perhaps even though there was a, a significant amount of work uh, going into this to develop the plat, uh, to adapt Smith's Zion plan, as well as getting the stakeholders involved based on all the names and codes and symbols and the, uh, and the parcels, many of the parcels, um, it, it does not appear, there's nothing that we've been able to find in evidence to suggest that an actual site was selected uh, for this, for this, uh, for a development based on the done plan. So our conclusions, um, you know, everything we looked at, all of the analysis of the the block and parcel and uh, street layouts, all of that, um, you know, conclusion, the main conclusion was that the Dunplat was in fact uh, a modernization, right? A modern, quote unquote, modern adaptation of Smith, uh, Smith's Zion plan. And in doing so, maintaining some of the key tenets of the original plan, right? The, the 132 foot street widths, a lot of the, the configuration, the block uh, or the parcel ratios, that type of thing, keeping many of those, um, you know, intact. Um, the fact that even though it, you know, it's a, it's a plat that does not show geographic features, um, the fact that you have names and codes and symbols written in uh, suggests that this wasn't just a hypothetical. This was something that, you know, that you had a lot of uh, key people and I, I'm not going into that, who some of those folks were, whose names were written into the plat, but they were, they were key people in the Petersburg scene. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, capitalists, we're talking about people who had experience in real estate development, who could have gotten, you know, development of this nature done. Um, so the fact that, you know, these things were in there, even though uh, there's no evidence to suggest that a site had been selected, um, it, it appears to have been done for more than just a conceptual exercise. Right with with this information, but again, um, we're not did not find anything in um, land use records, chancery records, anything of that nature, uh, pointing to a particular site. And um, many of the people that were that were in, you know, whose names were in the plat uh, by the 1880s, they were they were kind of out of the picture, either died or no longer, you know, active in in um, business activity. Uh, so um, you know, kind of get the impression. 
that um, you know a lot of this just sort of faded away. Um, there was, of course, you know, starting in the 1870s, um, there was uh, you know very very serious um, you know kind of crash in the economy. Uh, so not a whole lot of capital that would have been available, perhaps um, you know just before that 18, late 1870s, early 80s. So a number of factors um, that uh, you know demonstrate that you know this is something that you know really really never got off the ground, um, and not not that it didn't make it through the entitlement process because again we're not seeing anything of what we would now call the entitlement process, not seeing anything uh, from a land claim standpoint to suggest that that folks were moving ahead. So. There are a couple of big questions that still remain. It still have me scratching my head on it and continuing to, to poke around. Um, you know, why, why did a, a prominent Petersburg engineer, um, and again, as I mentioned, you've become the city of Petersburg's chief engineer, uh, draft a plat based on Joseph Smith's plan for the city of Zion. None of the members, none of the individuals whose names appear in the plat or done himself um, there's nothing to indicate that they were LDS followers. Um, in fact, many of the folks uh, whose names appear in the plat were uh, lay leaders and uh, mainline Protestant denominations. So, you know, the, one of the big questions is, you know, how how did you know how did this happen? How was it that that T.R. Dunn drafted a plat based on uh, Smith's Zion plan? Um, because you know, if you're just going to go out and plan a new development. Chances are you're not going to you're not going to apply a Smith's Zion plan unless there were some specific drivers uh, behind that. And then you know the the next question is as I was alluding to a second ago, you know what happened? What happened to prevent you know many of the prominent people uh, that were involved in the Dunn Platt, the stakeholders of the Dunn Platt? What happened that that kept them from proceeding? With a development plan based on based on this plat, so uh, those are a few things that I continue to look into. Um, you know, again, uh, purely on a volunteer basis, but um, a couple of things that hopefully uh, working collaboratively with the LVA will will continue to get some answers. And if we do, we'll we'll definitely um, reach out to the APA Virginia chapter and see if we we can come back to you and answer some of those questions. But with that, um, before we open it up, I just want to reference, um, I cover this information in a lot uh, more detail, um, uh, you know, in, a, in more discussion um, in an article that was just published in the Portland, the winter issue of the Portland, which is the Journal of the Washington Map Society. Um, there's an article by the same name, the same title as this webinar. Uh, so uh, that, that a copy of that is in the Library of Virginia Holdings. So if you'd like to take a look at that, please, you know, reach out and um, we'll get you, uh, you know, access uh, to that information. But um, with that, I, you know, again, I just, just want to thank the uh, Virginia APA chapter. Uh, thanks to the Library of Virginia, Cassandra Farrell and to Eric Putsen for all your support on this effort. And uh, Martina, I'm going to turn it back to you to field questions coming in. Yeah, we have um we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, we had a question from um, Jeffrey Harvey. It looked like the Zion plans had alleys going both in north and south and east and west directions. The Dunn plan appeared to show alleys just in. The, did I just read that wrong? Um, the Dunn plan <laughs> appeared to show alleys just in the east west orientation. Do you have a theory on this different on this difference? Sorry for butchering that. No, so there's. If you look at the, if you look at the Zion plan, the original Zion plan, and then the revised plan, we're not, we're not. So what you're seeing, um, there's, there's not a delineation or definition of alleys. Um, what they, what they really are, are more, um, you know, the parcel boundaries, and because of the crosshatch nature of the parcel boundaries they're not really defined as alleys, okay? So it's really kind of a budding, each parcel is kind of a budding to each other. Um, whereas in the, in the Dunn plat, you, you definitely see where alleys are specified. Again, given that, that um, you know, the 50 foot width uh, clearly delineated. Whereas on the uh, original and revised um, Zion plan, uh, it's there. The alleys are not defined as more of the parcel down. 
Great. We have a question from Matthew Bolster. Do you know how this plat ended up in the public collection? Uh, that's something I know was acquired. Um, again, it was quite, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was February 2015, but Cassandra Farrell uh, can give you more details on the, um, on the accession of that. But um, that, is, that is all I know, that it was acquired uh, by the Library of Virginia back in 2015. But with regard to its provenance, that would be an, a Library of Virginia question. All right. Were many LDS congregations or followers present in Virginia in the late 19th century, or were Zion Platt features adopted in non-LDS city plans or plats elsewhere? Yeah, that's a great question. The answer is um, the Virginia, especially the southwest corner, and you'll see you'll see you know more treatment of this if you're interested. You'll see more treatment of this in the article, um, but southwest Virginia and northwest uh, North Carolina was actually called the nest um, because of the amount of LDS activity. I mean, that's, that's what the LDS itself called, called it. Um, uh, Tazewell County was, was actually called Little Nauvoo uh, because of the, the high amount of, um, of LDS activity. Bina Vista, of course, um, at, having just moved back to Virginia from South Florida, I still want to call it Buena Vista, but that's not it. So Buena Vista, of course, was um, was was very much, you know, very prominent um, as an LDS community. Um, the LDS itself found, uh, formed what was called the Southern States Mission. Um, that was an organizing you know, entity that, you know, throughout the southeastern United States, it was a hotbed of uh, LDS mission activity throughout this area. And Virginia was definitely uh, one of those locations. Um, so in terms of other um, communities, I mean, you know, you can see hints of, um, in some of the areas, you can see hints of um, the Zion plan and the influences of, of the Zion plan, but it was a very different landscape. I mean, uh, you know, literally and figuratively. Um, the LDS, uh, well, uh, I'll put it like this, LDS, LDS church histories refer to the southern states and the southern states mission. They refer to the southern states as lands below the Smith and Wesson line. I'm um, talking about uh, the you know the the arms manufacturer because there was there was a lot of conflict um, between LDS and non LDS uh, in that time period. So not a whole lot, and which was one of the main reasons why you had the westward migration. So you have more you have more settlements as you go west based on the Zion plan than you do on the, the East Coast. All right. Um, let's see. And I think this is kind of similar. Why was uh, the, why was density so high on original, on the original Zion plot? Um, can you speak to that? Uh, the persons per household? I yeah. believe yeah. so. And I mean, if Mike Walls asked the question, uh, maybe he wants to clarify or Mike, if you if you want to um, unmute, we can unmute you if you want to clarify. Let's see. Mike can unmute if he wants to. But we'll see. Hi. Yeah, I was asking about the uh, size per how average density per household being significantly higher in that first plat. Yeah, and that that was based again. That was based on the instructions um, from you know from Joseph Smith. That estimate, that persons per household estimate, was sort of like his instructions to the LDS faithful, saying you know you know essentially be fruitful and multiply. I mean you know the, you know to have large families, you know, living, um, you know, in, in each household. So that, that population per household is, is right out of the original Zion plan and, and Smith's in, instructions to, to the followers. Um, same, um, same with the revised Zion plan. Uh, they, you can, you know, obviously you can tell that they brought that, uh, that density down. So you had uh, you know, much lower seven, still 7.7 .7 persons per household uh, was was still not that small, right? I mean, it was still a, a fairly large, uh, but I, you know, I, I used the 5.69 Virginia's average 
based on the 1880 census, um, you know, to put it, you know, put it in more, you know, more actual terms as opposed to prescribed terms. But yeah, that 20.7 persons per household was the high end. And I will say um, there was a low estimate, a low range estimate um, in the in the original instructions. But, you know, that's the high end estimate, um, you know, for comparison. So, so the plan was to put the full extended multi wife household compound onto one of those lots. That, that correct. That's correct. a lot smaller lot uh, per household than I was thinking of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, that's again, it was it was a, a half acre lot as opposed to the Dunn Platte, which is, you know, just over a third of an acre. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's the that's the intent is to have, you know, each each household on each parcel would have would have, you know, had, you know, substantial number of family members. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, we have a question from Sherry. Um, was Smith's Zion plan based on any other city plan, American or European? Do you know? The original Zion plan? Um, no. The immediate answer is no. I mean, the immediate answer is, is this was, you know, this was, you know, ported to be, you know, Joseph Smith's um, you know, vision that that Joseph Smith would have had, um, and and let me just say, you know, I I'm I am not a member of the LDS, so I don't want to speak on anything associated with that. I'm not a member of the of the LDS, um, you know. So you know, this is purely based on my research. But the original Zion plan was issued as more, you know, based on his religious principles and a vision that he purportedly had, um, and and laid it out. Now that said. You know, there you can't, you know, you can't help but to see, um, you know, you know, potential influences, especially the urban grid pattern, things of that nature. But um, in terms of Joseph Smith um, citing or referencing or saying that, you know, this, you know, we kind of picked up from Oglethorpe and planned for Savannah, or we picked up from Penn's plan for Philadelphia. That was never done. It was, it was uh, basically uh, espoused as a um, a religious kind of experience and, and vision that he had. And that's that's where this came from. And you can tell, you can tell from the um, you know, from the the writings, it wasn't just the it wasn't just the plat, if you will, it was his written instructions to the faithful as as part of this as well. Um, we have a, a comment before I move to the next question. Peter shared mm -hmm. Um, just a comment, looking at my copy of the 1890s plot of the Belmont neighborhood in Charlottesville, it's striking how gigantic the Dunn plans 132 foot wide streets and 50 foot wide alleys would have been. Belmont's main avenue width is 80 feet, other avenues 60 feet, streets 50 feet, and alleys 12 feet. So just sharing, a he's sharing a comment there. Yeah, yeah. And if you've ever, if you've ever been to Salt Lake City, that, you know, is, is a, obviously a thriving example of uh, you know Smith's Zion plan put into action, and even Salt Lake City. If you look at you know the the original plats and everything for Salt Salt Lake City, it took into account you know the local context. I mean, you got mountains coming right up to the edge of the city. So, um, but if you've been in Salt Lake City and crossing the street, even in the urban core, um, 132 foot wide streets, they actually give you flags as a pedestrian, so you can hold the flag up so the cars. Which of course will drive as fast as they feel. You know, the drivers will drive as fast as they feel comfortable driving. You know, they can make sure that they can see you. So, yeah, this was. I mean, these were large streets, right? These are very large streets. And even even if you look, Ebenezer Howard, you know, his Garden Cities um, and the big radio boulevards that were planned for the Garden Cities of you know of tomorrow uh, by you know from Ebenezer Howard, those those major arterials, those major boulevards were only 120. So yeah, it's big. Um, okay, we have a our next question. We have time for maybe one or two more. Um, interesting presentation. Are there records of LDS congregations or followers in Virginia in the late 19th century? Also, were um, were Zion City Plan features? I think we already kind of answered this one. Yeah, um, but let me let me let me mention something real quick on that because it's it's a it's an it's an interesting question and. Because of the conflict between LDS and non-LDS, um, there, 
you did have, it, it was more like a, you gathered um, in areas, if you were LDS, you gathered in areas where you felt safe. So, you know, typically being, uh, you know, speaking, it, you know, kind of small gatherings. So you didn't have large like congregations um, that, that you would now. Um, and in fact, you had quite the opposite. Um, it was it was kind of typical practice, and I cite this in the article. It's kind of typical practice for even the leaders of the LDS to use pseudonyms, uh, you know, for protection purposes to maintain the confidentiality uh, for themselves for other members. Um, but one of the things I did to kind of get an idea of that time period is I looked at LDS, you know, member uh, missionaries from the LDS Southern States Mission who were traveling and doing mission work, mission activity uh, in Virginia um, through this area in the late 1800s. And that gave me an idea, you know, so you did have kind of gatherings of folks, but it, it wasn't, you know, because of conflict, it wasn't as open and, you know, large congregations coming together like you would have now. All right, well, we have a couple other questions and what I'll do, Joe, is I will just share those with you and okay. let you connect with those people individually, just trying to be, we try to be pretty conscious of everybody's time, but um, thank you for being with us. I'm gonna share a couple quick reminders. Um, as I mentioned, our annual conference is coming up July 17th through the 20th. Um, you can find everything um, at apavirginia.com on that. But also, I hope everybody, I didn't mention this before, will join us for next month's webinar on April 25th. It's One Path to AICP Overview, Tips and Pointers for Earning Your AICP Certification. Um, that's going to be presented by John Harbin, who's our Professional Development Officer. Or as these always are, they're free and open to anybody. If that's something you want to share with, with someone or pass along, please feel free to. I've shared the registration in the chat. Um, and then obviously that will be added to your post webinar um, email that'll go out shortly with the link to this recording, as well as all of the presentation materials and um, all the contact information for our speaker today. Um, with that, uh, I just want to thank you, Joe, for being with us. Do you have any closing remarks that you want to wrap up with? No, just to say what an honor it is uh, to, um, to have the opportunity to present. As I mentioned, I just recently, over the last um, year or so, or a couple of years, moved back to Virginia. So very excited to have this opportunity. would love uh, to uh, continue the conversation with you all. But thanks so much for the opportunity to present to APA Virginia. Well, wonderful. And thank you for being with us. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us. And we will see everybody um, on April 25th for next month's webinar. Thank you and have a great Monday. Thanks, everyone.